Hello, good morning, Dobro jutro. Welcome, Dobro došli. Um, I am uh, Eric Gordy from University College London. Uh, I am the coordinator of the, uh, um, of the project about which you'll be hearing all day. Uh, if, uh, um, if I may just say, we have here representatives from the partner institutions who collaborated on the INFORM project, uh, representatives from state institutions, from the non-governmental sector and intergovernmental sector, uh, from media, welcome to, uh, um, to all of you. Um, I will simply say a little bit about the INFORM project in general because you'll be hearing in, uh, in detail. Um, before I begin, I would simply like to take a moment to uh, um, to offer our uh, um, our our thanks and uh, and regrets for um, our deeply esteemed colleague uh, Christian Giordano, who is a member of our advisory board. Um, Christian Giordano is an anthropologist, I think a monumental anthropologist, and had tremendous dedication to uh, um, to the project. He passed away in uh, in December and uh, um, and is very deeply missed by um, by all of us. Um, having said that, let me say a little bit of something about the project. Um, the INFORM project began in response to a request from the European Commission for research that would be useful in the process of European integration of, uh, of Southeast European states. And what we uh, um, what we came up with as a general observation is that the process of European integration can be viewed different ways. On the one hand, um, if you look at the question of whether laws that are requested by the European Union are adopted by candidate states in the region, then every state in the region is doing wonderfully well. You ask them to adopt a law, they adopt it. Um, but we know something about these laws. We had a report last week, for example, <laughs> Um, analyzing processes in the, uh, um, in the parliament of Serbia. And in Serbia in the last year, 70% of laws that were adopted were adopted through urgent procedure, that is without debate, discussion, or, uh, um, or amendment. Our basic insight is that regardless of what laws are adopted, um, that most aspects of everyday life, the way that people get the jobs done that they need to do in order to live and function, are not described by law, um, but, uh, but instead are described by informal practices that are familiar to people on the ground and, uh, and are unknown or un opaque to outside observers. Um, so we want to look at the difference between the world as it is described in legal documents and the world as it is lived by the people who, uh, um, who are in it. And this was fascinating for us because I think uniquely among social scientific projects, generally, as a social scientist, when people ask you what you're working on, you tell them and they say, that's really complex or that's really esoteric. I don't understand it. With this project, you could go into any coffee shop in any state in the region, tell people what the project is about, and they would say, yes, I know what you mean, and start telling you stories and giving you examples <laughs> of this gap between formality and informality that, uh, that we're talking about. So this is something that everybody knows. Or does everybody know it? Nobody knows the extent of informality. Nobody knows uh, the, uh, um, the character of attitudes toward informality, the consequences of informality. Thanks to this project, now we know. Um, what INFORM did, um, we surveyed people on the extent of informality with a large-scale survey, an average of around 1,000 respondents in uh, six states in the, uh, in the region. Um, what a survey will do is it will give you a little bit of information about a lot of topics. So people would tell us things, uh, for example, we would ask them, have you been offered gifts or favors in exchange for a vote at elections? We got shockingly high numbers. In most states, the numbers of people saying yes to this were enough to make a, um, a concrete difference in the results of elections. What we didn't know is what they meant by this. What is a gift? What is a favor? How were their votes influenced? Um, and so we uh, filled in those gaps in knowledge um, by, uh, um, by interviewing people who had responded, by interviewing brokers in communities, by doing ethnography in communities. We have a good sense of what is meant by informal practices and, uh, and what their consequences are. Um, what uh, results uh, did this produce? What are the contributions of the project? Um, I think that we have at least two. First, 
Um, as a result of our surveys, our interview, and an ethnography, um, we have really built a comprehensive picture um, of what we can call the emerging um, political order or disorder, um, the emerging system of informal governance, informal states in, uh, um, in, in the Balkans. And uh, this is something, you know, regional uh, surveys and research, uh, this was done frequently during the time that Yugoslavia existed. There are many large-scale studies. Um, since Yugoslavia ceased to exist, these have not been done. We've, uh, um, we've now done it. We've, uh, we've continued that tradition. Um, and the other big contribution that I have, that I think we have, um, is, uh, is in the way that informality is viewed and understood. Uh, generally speaking, in the existing literature on informality, there are two extremes. Uh, one extreme tends to view informality as a problem. It tends to view informality as a kind of synonym for, um, for corruption, for crime, as something that needs to be eliminated and replaced with formal procedures. Um, we think that this is a mistake. This is what Max Weber warned about a hundred years ago about the uh, replacement of, uh, of substantive with, uh, <laughs> formal, uh, with formal reason. The other extreme is to celebrate informality, um, to look at it as a spontaneously developing set of solutions to problems that are caused by institutional structures. Um, this view is often accompanied by a stereotype of, uh, um, of the Balkans, a place where people engage in informality because they like to socialize, because, uh, um, because they tend to live in bad states. Um, this is also a stereotype in extreme. It is, uh, it is uncritical. Our solution to this dilemma was to approach the question of informality phenomenologically, to, uh, to get empirical answers as to how informality works on the ground. And we do have instances where informality looks a lot like, uh, like corruption, where it uh, um, prevents establishment of the rule of law. And we also have instances in which uh, informal practices contribute to solutions to, uh, um, to real problems um, in the ways that, uh, um, that women who are compelled to, uh, um, to start businesses in the informal sectors find ways of integrating um, the need for work, the need to earn living, a living um, with the need to, uh, um, to, um, to care for family members and, uh, um, and others, ways in which informal practices uh, accommodate um, ethnic, national, and religious diversity in societies in ways that are better than the ways that formal practices do. Um, so I think that we have, uh, you know, by approaching the problem phenomenologically, we have solved some of the dilemmas, resolved some of the dilemmas uh, in theoretical approaches to, uh, to informality. You'll see some of this in the book that uh, we'll be presenting uh, later this afternoon with our policy proposals related to informality. You will see more of it in the book that uh, um, will be published later this year where we present our principal uh, empirical and theoretical findings. Um, but all of this is simply by way of teasing you. You have heard enough of me talking generally about the project. Um, what you'll be hearing the rest of the day is our researchers who have been working in the field talking in detail about how informality works, what it does, what it means, and, uh, and what we can do about it.